Okay. Hi, this is Silver with Two Not Two Black Moms, and here we're here with our couples coffee chat. And uh, I have my husband Ed with me today, and I'm also here, obviously, with Camille. Hey, so it's me and my husband Sharif, and we also have joining us John and Jane Doe, and another friend B. Uh, and Silver, would you like to explain why we're using aliases? Yeah, so one of the reasons that we're using aliases and that this is purely a podcast, audio, and not on video is that we want to ensure that people are comfortable in sharing, and I think it's ridiculous that we have to do this, but we understand that when people speak up, it can impact their employment situations, their social situations, and things like that. So I think that by providing anonymity, it has nothing to do with not wanting to speak up. It's actually giving people an opportunity to speak up because unfortunately these types of conversations can have negative impacts on people depending on where they're employed and things like that. So that's just something that we want to avoid because while we have a smaller group today, we do have other people interested in joining us and kind of having these conversations, just, you know, casual conversations of very important topics. But if you're worried about your boss having a different opinion than you and that impacting how you are treated at work or consequences at work or anything like that, you don't get to have these conversations. And I think that because we've had such great conversations together and private and we want to share them, we want to make sure that we get to share them. So um, John and Jane Doe, you know, kind of gave us this idea for it because um, they called me up with some questions and wanted to kind of discuss just racial topics in general and racial justice and how that kind of goes into even like church and our relationships and faith and things like that. And again, we just want to make sure that people have a platform where they're comfortable having these conversations. So on that note, um, we want, one of the things that we discovered in having this conversation, me and Ed and John and Jane, was that a lot of this comes from confusion over terms. You know, what, what is racism? What is bigotry? What's prejudice? Um, can a white person be racist? I mean, well, uh, can a black person be racist <laughs> against a white person? You know, can, uh, what is the difference between racism and bigotry and prejudice? And um, I'd also even throw in there some like political terms, uh, Black Lives Matter, police, things like that, defund police, you know, people get caught up on these terms, these hashtags, and the, it takes away from the overall message, not because of the people who are saying it, but because of these preconceived notions people have in associating with it. So um, I'm going to turn it over to John in a second to kind of give us these terms on prejudice and racism, because I think he did a great job articulating it. And um, as a white individual, I think it's great to hear it from him, because he's explaining yes. it to people who are going to understand it coming from the same worldview to a certain extent. But um, just for an example, like when we, Camille and I frequently hashtag Black Lives Matter, because that is a truthful statement. We believe that Black Lives Matter. We believe every life matters. We believe all life matters, but we're hashtagging Black Lives Matter because that is a situation that needs addressing currently. And um, it is not because we were aligning with a, with a specific political party. It is not because we were aligning with one specific organization or one specific leader or anything like that. It's saying we believe Black Lives Matter and we want to say that out loud because there are so many wonderful organizations and there are great politicians that are involved and there are great leaders that are involved. And there are some that you may or may not align with, but that does not change that Black Lives Matter. So we're just gonna keep saying it. So we're just gonna throw that out there in case that comes up in the conversation. Please don't make any assumptions about, you know, what that means in terms of our faith or what that means in terms of our political alignment or anything like that. Um, but on that note, John, if you kind of wanted to share a little bit what you, accidentally shared too soon on the terms, you know, between what, what do you as a white individual understand in terms of racism, bigotry, and prejudice? So I think um, these are really important terms, and I think they're um, terms that are, are uh, tied together, but they're not all the same, and, and the distinctions really make a difference um, in terms of the conversation we're having. So bigotry, uh, is, as I understand it, that's 
a term for people that actually uh, think they're better than others based on a characteristic. So if it's race, it's, I think it would be, I, if I thought I was better because I was white, right? Or if it's actual animus toward another people, it's bigotry. So a lot of people, um, when they hear the term racism, they actually think it means bigotry. They're, so they say, you know, I'm the, not racist. But what, they, what they're really trying to say is I'm not a bigot. I don't hate because of this characteristic. Um, but that's really different. So prejudice is, is, a, is a different term and it has a broader meaning, right? So prejudice is more about um, judging by outward appearances, coming to it with assumptions about someone based on the way they look. Um, and, and even the scriptures tell us we do this, right? They say man judges by the outward appearance, but God judges by the heart. It's not right that we do this. It's just our nature and we got to learn where our blind spots are and fight against it because it's just not right. And it, it, it generalizes based on our past experience, which is really limited um, or, or even just stuff we heard and it just doesn't end up making sense. Um, there can be a lot of ignorance and prejudice because it's based on these like faulty assumptions a lot of the time. Um, and so I think what racism really is, is where either prejudice and probably prejudice in most cases, we hope, uh, or bigotry meets a power structure. If you're walking down the street and somebody says something ignorant to you, um, maybe you brush it off because um, that person doesn't really matter. They're not going to impact your life. You may never see them again. It hurts a little bit, but, but you get over it real quick. But if, if that person is your boss, if that person is a coworker at work with you, if that person is a police officer, a mayor, someone in government, somebody with a little bit of power, um, suddenly their ignorance actually has a cost to you. That actually like creates risk for you and your family because of the way they see you. It can create risk for your safety because they're coming at you with a set of assumptions that don't necessarily hold true and that, that could have a direct impact on the way they treat you and they have power behind them to do something about that. So that um, is what people I think are really talking about when they're talking about systemic racism and stuff. It's, 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 there are prejudices, we won't even worry about bigotry, there's prejudices in this power structure and it's gonna affect the way people are treated based on characteristics that really shouldn't matter for the analysis, right? Um, so I think it's really important to, defer, to define these terms because, and even the term Black Lives Matter, like you said, um, that's something that I can affirm. That's a message I can affirm. But I think in this big conversation that we're trying to have as a country right now, I think it's, it's really important to carefully define what we mean because there are people that look at these kind of situations on both sides, you know, no matter where you are, but they look at these situations as an opportunity for a power grab for themselves, not like trying to, you know, not trying to get rights for people, but trying to, you know, uh, franchise themselves at the expense of the movement. You know what I mean? Um, and what happens is um, they make these, they'll make radicalized statements, right? Statements that imply a set of political beliefs that probably isn't general to the, the movement itself, probably isn't the real point of the conversation um, or, or too extreme, you know? in in the view and what happens then is the other side of the conversation grabs onto that and and then flips the, the the narrative right and then they say okay these people are all about this right and then and then the conversation just evolves into this polarized thing that doesn't work anymore it, it, it basically gives both sides an excuse to ignore everything the other one's saying um because no one's really listening to each other anymore now now the, the, the radicals on one side made a statement and now it's everybody's like that, you know, and, 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 and we can't even talk to each other and, and we're talking past each other. Um, I've run into that where I want to have valuable conversation with friends and family members who um, I think maybe haven't grappled with some of these concepts before, or maybe they've never had to before. Um, and so it's something new for them to kind of talk about uh, issues of race and racial identity and all of that. And I want to have these conversations. And sometimes if I bring up like a, like a buzzword, I've been calling them, you know, and if I haven't defined that terms ahead of time and I say one of these buzzwords, they totally shut down because they're coming in, I guess, with their prejudices of what 
you know, I'm talking about, or uh, they come in assuming, oh, well, this is what you must be standing for. So I can't talk about that. And it totally shuts down the conversation and then we can't go anywhere. So I've actually um, learned from you, Silver, about defining the terms ahead of time. And that's really helped me as I navigate these conversations that people know where I'm coming from and uh, they know what I'm talking about without jumping to assumptions and shutting the conversation down before we get anywhere. Yeah, I think that's kind of a lot of it is just we, every, it's because like it's a buzzword. People shut down when they hear this. So if somebody who has never really, let's talk about, you know, the average girl next door, you know, she is, treats people nicely. She's sweet. You know, she does, she's colorblind in her own, in her own terms. And someone says something like, you know, hey, that statement is a little bit racist, or I've seen racism within our education system. And, and that can feel like a personal attack, even though it's not simply because we're not understanding the terms. And so no one's saying that you are this racist individual who is doing something wrong because you work at this school. It's, hey, I see a systematic issue here, and how can we address it? But if we're not understanding those terms, like you said, the conversation tends to get shut down. And then we don't ever get to have these conversations, so it can be really hard. Did you want to say something? Yeah, and I mean, I can I agree with your thoughts, and there's a pattern to um, people to, that don't experience a lot of life with different races, and when they don't have that experience of, um, you know, dealing with black families and associating with black families and, you know, like even going to a church that have, you know, black families or Indian families, any cultures and such, um, you know, um, I, I see a pattern where, you know, they keep their distance in most cases. And then, you know, when that whole conversation comes up about, you know, races and, you know, prejudice, they tend to hold their ground, but not really want to understand, you know, what the conversation is all about. And when you try to explain to them, like you and Silver said, they don't know how to respond to it. They shut down. They, they, they kind of try to hold their ground or they say like they're offended or some way. Um, I mean, I see a pattern in that. Well, I want to, Go ahead, Kim. Okay, I wanted to add to something that Ed was saying about that is that I think a lot of times people don't want to back down because then it feels to them like an admission of guilt. Like if they admit like, oh, sorry, I didn't realize that was racist. To them, it feels like they're admitting that they're being racist. And that is a really hard thing for some people to swallow. Yeah, and it's a shame too. Like this, a lot of times when you're trying to have a normal conversation with people about different topics, it's almost like some people just act like children. Like they just throw their hands up and they're like, they're just in all like, in all honesty, like you said, they start feeling guilty. They don't know how to react to the conversation. And the easy way out is just throw your hands up, walk away and make a big deal about, you know, and, you know, just throw a hissy fit. And honestly, like to have a pure conversation, you know, you need to sit down, you need to exchange you know, um, thoughts and, you know, facts about certain things and it has to be, you know, mature. Like, and that's what, that's the thing I feel like a lot of people miss that maturity. Well, I think Camille hit it though. It's that guilt. Nobody likes to feel guilty and it's easier to deflect and make yourself the victim of offense than it is to accept that maybe you did do something wrong. And even if it was unintentional and just even coming from, you know, a faith perspective, like that's pride. And we all have it. We all have it, you know, and it's something that we need to check. And like, um, Mm -hmm. John was saying on the, um, prejudice side, every human, like if you are breathing, you have a bias somewhere in your life. We all have them, but as mature individuals, especially if you have faith that needs to play out in being aware of your bias and saying like man looks on the outward god looks at the heart okay if i'm to be more christ like i need to be looking at people's hearts and not judging them you know and so 
but again, it's that easy, I think you really nailed it. I don't wanna feel guilty, so I'm just gonna deflect. It's a lot easier to deflect than feel that. So now that we kind of understand these terms, um, I think that we already understood it, but as we move forward in this conversation for people who are listening, I think it's really beneficial to understand these terms. So, um, you know, and if you say, go to have a conversation with a family member and you say something and a lot of people's response is, well, black people are just racist. Or, you know, this black person was my neighbor and they were really rude to me because I'm white. And I think that, you know, John really nailed it. Like that's prejudice. Any human that exists can be prejudiced. But if you do not have a level of power, you can't be racist. And in this country, minorities don't have that same level of power. So we are not capable of being racist in a way that impacts your life greatly. We can treat you poorly. We could be rude. Um, we can be prejudiced. Um, and that's just, that's wrong. But we don't have that power to, we don't have that power like John was talking about. That, that is what is the difference um, when somebody responds with, hey, I think, you know, there's, there's racism in the school. And they're like, well, my child had a black teacher and they didn't treat them nicely. But that is an incident that I think because there's power structures not there that will get addressed and it'll get fixed. And what we see in a pattern of like racial mm -hmm. disparities in education and other places is that when it's the minority that's struggling, we don't see the things getting fixed. It doesn't make either of the behaviors acceptable, but the, the stats, the numbers, they're showing us that we're not getting justice. So the argument like with police um, issues where um, there may have been an overstep of power with police and people are like, well, it happens to every race. It does, but where are we seeing it happen disproportionately and where are we seeing it happen where we're not seeing it being taken care of? Mm -hmm. Address. Yeah. It's where it's not being addressed, right. And so people can be prejudiced against police. You know, that is something that could happen and that would be equally wrong. But we don't have that power structure over that. You know what I mean? Like we're talking about systematic issues. We're not talking about individuals. Prejudice from anybody is wrong. But, you know, just making sure that we're all kind of on the same terms moving forward. You know, those are the kind of things. And I know that kind of went off topic a little bit, but we'll bring it back in here. With um, I would just kind of like to ask and, uh, Camille and Sharif if you guys want to kind of get us started here. Um, with everything that's been happening, you know, obviously we already have everything is even worse with like pandemic and COVID and all of that. So we're already kind of like drained in general, but adding in like racial tensions and kind of figuring out our role as like believers and, uh, just like kind of as a couple, as individuals, how are you guys kind of coping and are these things impacting you? Are you, you know, are you impacted by the racial tension and everything that's kind of going on? I mean, I guess you can go first. Okay, so for me, I think more so just because I've kind of put myself out there. Uh, because of the pandemic, we're kind of, we've been pretty isolated. So uh, it hasn't, we live in a majority Black neighborhood. Well, on a majority Black street, I should say. Our kids have a pretty diverse group of friends, but we haven't really been connecting with people outside of social media. So personally, it really hasn't, but when it comes down to like how we put ourselves out there we've definitely i know i've noticed that i've opened myself up to people saying things um you know that really are enraging like it's crazy um you know like people just assuming that uh black people wanting to take over or you know like hearing those things over and over again like oh you know, they're just trying to shift power and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, no, we just kind of want you to treat us fairly. That's it. <laughs> or that's arguing all. about the whole um, racism versus prejudice. And it's like, yeah, Black people can be prejudiced. And some of that is reactive or responsive to, you know, years and years of treatment or mistreatment from other people. Um, but having to argue the point about racism being a valid thing or people saying like, oh, well, you have all the same opportunities as everyone else, and it's just an excuse. Um, so having to uh, insert myself in those arguments and really just 
opening my eyes even more to bigoted people online has been hard. It's been really hard and draining. Yeah, and for me, like, it has a it has an impact on me um, from the standpoint of when I go out, when I leave the house. Um, now you really have to be extra concerned, you know, when you go in certain neighborhoods, um, mm -hmm. you know, what's going to happen when it's just me in the car and then I got five dudes that, you know, in another vehicle and they say, oh, what you doing over here? What you doing up here? And then they want to, you know, do something. Or, you know, from the standpoint of what happens when now, you know, there's that cop that I feel like is you know, there to protect me. Listen, I'm a law-abiding citizen. Um, but then, you know, all of a sudden, just because I'm the wrong guy in the wrong neck of the woods, it's like, let's pull it out over and make sure he, uh, let's, let's see what he's doing. But even though they find out I'm doing everything right, it still could turn around and be a problem. And I could potentially not make it home. And then it all, so it affects me on the mental front. And then I also, you know, have to more so, I've always had it in my mind, but I have to more so keep it in mind when, you know, with my kids, you know, what happens the day, you know, when they out and about on their own. So I, I can't really let them out of my sight too much. Although at any given moment, anything can happen from anybody. It, um, it makes it a lot more harder um, with what's currently going on in the climate of this country, period, especially on the racial front, because, you know, you know, somebody could just come at you and attack you just because of what you look like. Um, and, you know, there's a viciousness in the hearts of people these days. And um, so, so I'm very concerned about that. Well, I guess I want to add to them because that just made me remember. Um, it has impacted us like so you guys know I'm from Erie we have to drive across the state to go see my family oh, yeah. and that was a concern like we have to drive through central PA and that's a lot of clan country and we were like is it really worth taking the risk driving through there in this climate running the risk of getting pulled over running the risk of you know someone pulling up next to us with a confederate flag on their car or you know us breaking down in an area where we're not welcome and that's terrifying and then also too like Sharika was saying about the kids like we have to worry about where we are how we're going to be received um you know making sure that our kids are not being too loud or too rowdy because we don't want to draw the wrong kind of attention yeah um and that's definitely something that we covered in that one video on uh Raising Black Sons versus Running Out of Ink. Um, if you haven't noticed, Camille and I are super sarcastic, and I am the one that has run out of ink with my blonde children. But um, just kind of, this is just something that kind of like popped into my mind when you were mentioning about like driving. And um, my brother's black, and I learned to drive a lot with him. Um, we're, you know, he's like a year older than me. So when we were teens, I guess I was a little, I was like 18, he was 19, we would go for drives, you know, we would go places, um, running errands, stuff like that, and I remember, like, getting pulled over with him, and it was fine, but I also remember, like, his response to being pulled over versus, like, I remember Ed and I ran out of gas one time, and we're in, like, this really nice neighborhood, and he's just, like, la, 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 getting out of his car, like, doing stuff like that, and, like, and then a cop pulls up behind us, and I'm, like, <gasps> And again, I am a, like, you, you know, like Sharice said, law-abiding citizen. I'm friends with police officers. Like, I am so grateful that I'm in a community with, like, really wonderful police officers. But it was so ingrained in me of being used to being with a Black male when we had police interactions. And, you know, at the time that I was with my brother, we've met, you know, he was, it was a fine interaction. But that doesn't change that heightened sense of, like, always having to be aware and it was funny because I was talking to my brother recently and I said something like well you know I know it's a lot for you but at least for me it's more you know I don't have to fear for my you know as being a light-skinned female I don't have to fear for like my safety most of the time but I am aware of like comments or getting followed in the store or things like that and he's like but still it's the same you have that sense of heightened awareness that you don't get to shut off and so that was something that, um, like, when you're kind of talking about that, I think that's what 
can be so stressful about these times for people is that extra heightened awareness. Um, I don't think that, you know, suddenly people have like, all become racist or anything of the sort. Um, I don't think all police are suddenly more violent or anything like that, like not even remotely. But as we have everything kind of like pushed more in the media and these conversations are happening and we're hearing the thoughts of the people who are racist, I think it's a little bit harder because even if your neighborhood hasn't changed, even if you don't have a specific personal incident um, in the last week or two weeks or since this pandemic, you have that heightened awareness. And that can be kind of, um, yeah, Jane, you want to chime in? So I've been really frustrated by comments of this is nothing new. I don't understand why the conversation is coming up again. Um, why do we keep having to talk about this? But I think it's ignorance to think that people haven't, um, sure, these things have always existed, but there is some sort of, um, like people are more emboldened right now too. Um, to just like be out there with their hate and their bigotry. Sorry, I get worked up. And to ignore that or to say this is just the same is wrong. And um, just going back, like we started this by saying when you have those conversations, start by defining the terms. And I just thought it was really important for us to talk about like why we need to be having the conversations where we are defining the terms. Um, it's not to, I don't have these conversations um, to convince people or to get people in my camp. It is something that I care a lot about. Um, you can't see on the podcast, I'm Chinese um, and I'm married to a white man. So we're in a biracial marriage and we've got biracial kids. Um, and the conversation is important to me because I think that so many people have seen in TV, on the news, um, all these different messages from movies, all these messages that form their prejudices. And th that's the only voices that have been loud and out there. And I think that, yes, while people have been emboldened to hate, um, I think that we are getting more of awareness that we need to stand up and be a louder voice still too, and to speak truth and to speak up and to, even um, be brave enough to share our stories, even if we need to do it with an alias, because people need to hear this side of things too, because if you have a direct interaction with somebody that um, you might've had a prejudice about, chances are your prejudice might change. And so um, having these conversations, saying these things out loud, it might not change someone's mind, but it will give somebody uh, something to think about. and. I think that especially as believers, we need to be thinking about these things, that we're called to be thinking about these things, to be searching our heart to see where our prejudices are. We heard a great message about generous justice um, by Tim Keller, and he was talking about if we really understood as a believer, if we really understood the gospel, if we really understood um, that we are sinners, that we are, you know. Just how far we came. Yeah, how far we came, what God has rescued us from. We wouldn't um, even, the whole white fragility thing, the whole, um, I don't want to be called a racist because it might mean that I need to take responsibility for my actions. That wouldn't even like come to play if we understood the fullness of the gospel because we would say, oh yeah, there's another area where Jesus had to rescue me from. Can I jump I in? I'm, I'm sorry, like, while you're on that topic, I just want to share that um, when you were talking about um, the people, so I just want to let you know, I grew up in a Ukrainian home, Russian, around a lot of Russians, um, so, and a really uh, wide, white, but I grew up in Levittown, and um, I remember just in the neighborhood, we only had, like, one black kid. You know, and good. Uh, honestly, it was nice because uh, everybody got along. Though. I mean, we didn't have problem. You know, we, ever, we were friends and stuff. But the thing is, like, never understood. You know, because I mean, I was young and never understood that. Um, just why or um, any any part of really racism until I really like we we really started dating and my wife and I started dating and I started noticing like people that had a lot of smart things to say like about like 
her jokes, um, inappropriate, like, you know, do, um, quotes, like, if we were dating and we were getting married, we were, like, you know, um, engaged, and somebody would say, like, oh, are you getting ready to go on welfare? Whoa, whoa, that, you know, like, Which I think is, I just want to point out one thing, though. Uh, we were the only ones that had never been on welfare. And yes. I am not knocking anyone who needs welfare. I am all about using, you as a taxpayer, you know, use what you need to use. I'm not judging anyone for being on welfare. But I do want to point out <laughs> that we were the only ones that have never been on welfare. But there was still the jokes, even for people who were on welfare, because I was black and that is black. And never mind that the statistics show that there are more white people on welfare than black people. But... We still, for whatever reason, associate this idea of like the lazy black person who doesn't work and just wants government handouts. Like there are still people who believe that despite all of the evidence. A lot of them. That points otherwise. Like there's so, like look at the like Department of Labor statistics, things like that. Like it's not true. But also, I mean, but people just, that. Sorry, just, that. I just had as, to point that as out. we were like, you know, dating and we were like engaged and we were young, young married couple. Um, you start to see, like, like, I mean, I'm just blessed, and I, I'll tell you, I'll be honest, I'm just blessed that God had connected us, you know, um, as a couple, because I told Silver, like, yesterday, two days ago, like, it's, it's, it's pure God's work that I'm here we're, as a couple, because then I would be just dumb and not understand the whole, like, you know, mentality of prejudice and racism, and bigotry, because a lot of people that I grew up with and a lot of people that um, kind of from, you know, the growing up for friends and Ukrainian, Russian church, like they, you still see that, you know, and I called a lot of them out on it. I mean, some of them, I just don't even bother because it's just like, it's just, just the maturity is not there, you know, to have a, a, a nice conversation, but overall, um, you know, as, as, as we were, you know, a couple and we're growing together, I had to go through things myself to really understand like my, like my fault, like, you know, kind of like Silver's end has to like squeeze that out of me and like really kind of like teach me honestly to, um, you know, well, we're prejudice led. I think it was just yeah. one of those. And what, just to clarify when he's saying like, Russians or Ukrainians. He does not mean the entirety of the population. No. Just like his specific circle of friends and relatives. You know what I mean? He's we're not assuming or suggesting that all Russians or anything like yeah, that are no, no. prejudiced. And and people like our friends here on this call know that. But you know, if there's people listening, I just want to clarify that. And I mean I'm just pointing that out because that's my culture that I grew up with. I'm not saying that, you know, everybody's like that. You know what I mean? And there's differences. I just pointing out that's part of who I grew up being as in my culture. And, you know, you deal with that. And any other cultures, you know, you, you can deal with other cultures, like all of that prejudice and, and, and such that's connected to that. I mean, I really appreciate hearing. Oh, sorry. I really no, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I, I really appreciate just hearing, like, how, how the, the, the current climate affects your lives because I think it's almost like giving your testimony sometimes. Sometimes it's the most powerful way you can get the message across is like, this is what this did to me. Right. And I, I just really appreciate it. Cause I mean, I, I'm like, I, I've said it before and I hope I'm not getting uh, way out in the field on this, but uh, I'm like the poster boy for white privilege. Right. I came from like a very like blue collar, like white family in a white town that went to a really small, very badly rated high school, you know, and, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, and I'm, a, and I'm a lawyer now, you know, like this kind of thing. So I came up, I got the education. I, I'm now a lawyer, you know, um, I'm yeah, white, I'm, I'm male, yeah. I'm over six feet tall and I'm blonde, right? Like, like it, <laughs> it, you can't really like from a, from an appearances standpoint, statistically, I think, and I don't know the statistics, but I'm, I'm thinking that probably gets you about the most credibility you can possibly have as a human being on the face of your appearance alone. And we all agree that that's not what it should get you, but that's what tends to happen, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, like, 
you know, so when people are, you know, I had to figure out the term white privilege and figure out what that meant. But it was like, because it's like, oh, well, I didn't come from money. Well, that doesn't matter. It, it's the fact that when I walk into a place, people assume things about me that are positive. And other people just don't have that, that experience, right? And, and so I just really appreciate hearing the experience from the other side because, you know, it, it, it helps me to start, I can't even say understand because I have never lived it, right? But I can say, I, it gives me a flavor for what it feels like. And I can start to sympathize and maybe empathize a little bit. Um, and I can start to un understand like how that affects people. Um, you know, I, I read an article by uh, like Shai Lin, for example, even, um, and he was talking about how a well-meaning like white person in his church was like, oh, we have like this baby gear for you. I'll leave it on my porch. And he was just like, I can't just go to some like, you know, probably white neighborhood and like walk up on somebody's porch and take something off the porch while they're not there and like get back in my car and drive away. And I was just like, I, I, that, I get that. That's, that's perfectly logical and it's got to be terrifying, you know, and, and, but you don't, you would never think about that. You know, it's the most routine thing you can imagine. Just a neighbor trying to help somebody out. But, but for him, it's an actual life risk, man. He doesn't know what's going to happen. Right. And, and big life, you know, it's just awesome. Well, I, I mean, it's terrible that this happens, but it's, it's really great to be able to get enough of a flavor to, to have, start to have a baseline to understand better. Compassion um, and empathy. This is why we have these conversations. Yes. I, with um, the COVID, oh, sorry. No, with no, the no. COVID, you can finish. I'm sorry. I thought you were I, done. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I, I have a habit of, yeah. With the COVID thing, I, um, I've been feeling a little misunderstood in certain contexts that I'm in. And, and just seeing the level of frustration and anger that it raises in me, just that tiny little bit of being misunderstood, right? Like that, I can't, I can't imagine on the grand scale, like, you know, and how a lifetime of that works. Sorry, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> Talking to him. <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, I kind of just wanted to piggyback off of uh, what Ed was saying earlier, and it kind of ties into what you both were talking about. Um, I was having a conversation with some friends, and we were just talking about how people tend to stick with people who look like them or people who they can identify with. And I, and I was telling them, I'm like, you have to be more intentional about becoming um, immersed in other cultures, because if you don't, you'll never understand them. And that's the only way that you're going to even chip away at prejudice. Um, and that conversation came up because I was talking with uh, some people who are maternal health workers. Um, and they were saying, you know, the maternal health world, uh, is pretty much white people, white women who are working it. And, you know, when they service their black clients, some of the things that are being said about them are not always positive. And it's because the, they don't really understand. And I'm like, you have to be intentional about getting to know people outside of what your initial prejudices are against them. Um, and you can't do that if you don't make sure that you're, ex um, I don't want to say exposing yourself, but more um, coming alongside, getting to know people for who they are instead of just making assumptions. You don't have to necessarily walk in someone's shoes in order to empathize with them. You can just come alongside them, have a conversation, and gain some understanding about who they are and why they are the way that they are. And then not always feel like you have to, um, you know, be afraid because people are afraid of what they don't know. And like Ed was saying, he grew up with minimal exposure to black people, um, you know, and it's like, it can be scary for someone to not know a thing, but to hear things about people all the time. If all you know is what you see on TV and what you see on the news, you'll think that every time you see a black person, they're going to beat you up and they're going to be loud and they're going to rob you or whatever. And it's like, that is not the case. That's not the case, but if you come into the community and you make it a point to make friends who don't look like you or don't believe like you, you can gain a broader point of view and become more well-rounded, and that takes away the stigma and the, the fear of the unknown. All right, guys, so that went a lot longer than we were anticipating, so we are breaking this 
podcast up into two parts. Please make sure that you stay tuned for Silver's response and everybody else's response to where Camille left off. And thank you guys again for listening and make sure you look for part two to continue this conversation.